pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have a couple of additions to the agenda under... Uh, Under bills, we all have we have an adjusted uh, bill log. Everybody should have one on the counter. Just got handed out. It's uh, 66 bills in the amount of $149,305.68. And also on the dates for the 12-175 under consent meetings for 2013, uh, there is a, um, a t uh, group going to Brecken on the tw and they'll be gone on the 23rd. And in order to assist anybody else on this council that would like to be joining the Brecker and Friendship Guild. Um, we'd like to make it uh, September 30th, and I understand from Mr. Morrow that that's acceptable for you. Yep, that's that's my recommendation. Thank you. So that would also be, so we would have a motion to approve the amended dates with the date changing from the 23rd to the 30th. Also, uh, Mr. Campbell will be uh, updating us on the PPT activity up in Lansing, and I believe that um, Linda Terhar has some Councilmember Tar about arts and culture, some activities are going on. Uh, these were handouts for the presentation. Okay. Uh, the update. Okay. At the beginning so, of do the you agenda. want to have anything under discussion or not? Okay. Are there any other changes to the agenda? Additions? No. Nope. So, we need a motion to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. Move Morrow. Second to Har. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We have everyone here, no absences, and Mr. Fordyce is going to give us an update on the green communities. That's an award. Good evening. Um, the Green Communities Challenge is a function of the Michigan Greens community, uh, and the Michigan Green Communities is a, a partnership of uh, several uh, local government officials and uh, the program is run by the Michi Michigan Municipal League, Michigan Townships, Townships Association, Michigan Association of Counties, the Michigan Energy Office, and the Department of Envi Environmental Quality. Um, they all uh, team together to provide uh, what they call a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, so lo local officials can basically have a forum to get together and share ideas um, about uh, energy efficiency and uh, other sustainability uh, practices. And in 2009, one of the things they did was started the Green Communities Challenge, which was um, set up to uh, kind of give some communities a framework to follow. Um, uh, you know, here's a, basically a, a checklist of, of good activities. Um, and to encourage kind of competition between the members of the of the network, and uh, and give another forum for getting ideas out there that uh, that other communities could use. So in 2009, the city participated in it, and in 2010, um, and at that time there wasn't really a uh, a recognition framework. There was just a, a kind of a list of participants, and you know everybody was recognized at the annual conference. Uh, and then the challenge faded away a little bit, and um, they revamped it, uh, revitalized it, <coughs> made it a little bit easier to administer, and brought it back for this year. And uh, I uh, filled out, uh, for the city, filled out the application, and uh, at the annual conference in November, uh, Celine was recognized as a, a bronze level community. Um, they want a little paper version of a bronze medal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, and um, I can, if you'd like, I can go over some of the things that we garnered points for, or just answer questions, or? That would be great. Points. Okay. Um, a couple of the items, uh, having a, an environmental commission um, and having a, a staff group to uh, discuss these type of issues. Um, we have a parks and recreation slash open space plan. Um, we've done energy audits on uh, all of our buildings. Uh, we've had uh, some uh, specific energy efficiency 
projects uh, such as the LED street replacement. And um, they also, in this new version of it, uh, focused a lot on uh, transportation. Uh, so we scored points for having a complete streets ordinance, having a non-motorized plan, and um, <coughs> excuse me, implementing parts of the plan, and then also for having a, an electric vehicle charging station. Um, farmers Market scored us points. Um, our work with uh, uh, Spark scored us points. Um, having a community uh, forestry and tree hazard mitigation plan, those are all both areas where we garnered some points. Um, having a stormwater management plan and um, also being part of a watershed protection plan. Uh, recycling within our buildings, uh, our residential recycling program, business recycling program, um, the uh, residential yard waste program gave us points. Um, the the new uh, pharmaceutical drop station that we have, we got uh, we got points for that also. Um, and then um, you also get points for sending people to the annual conference. So, <laughs> so we got some points for that too. <laughs> And, you know, there's multiple, multiple things that we you know, did not get points for. And, um, and that's, again, one of the purposes of this, give, give communities a, you know, a framework to work in and, and some things to, to shoot for. Any questions? Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the Environmental Commission and Dave's active um, support and ideas. So I know they work really hard. Ideas, so. No, thank you. Uh, and I wanted to thank uh, Jeff on behalf of myself and the Environmental Commission for participating in this green communities effort. And um, maybe next year we'll get a <coughs> real silver one maybe. instead of a paper one. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. Anybody else have any questions for Mr. Fordyce? Good job. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Um, our next uh, is uh, Nancy Byers, going to give it, the chair, is going to give us our Arts and Culture Committee update. Thanks for coming in. I'm Nancy Byers from the Arts and Culture Committee. And I spoke to you earlier in the year about the sculpture walk that the committee was finalizing at that time. And I'm happy to report that the sculptures have been in place for a few months. Um, just to recap for any of you who uh, aren't familiar, we added five loaned art pieces to six permanent sculptures in town, and this is what make up the sculpture walk. Um, we featured the sculpture walk in these brochures that Karen Raglan designed, and that if you don't have, didn't already have a copy, I, Karen, uh, Linda has some copies for you, but it's, it's a beautiful, uh, brochure and it's available at a lot of locations throughout town. Um, the sculpture walk is uh, meant to rotate um, pieces so in January the committee will start putting out a call to artists and begin the process of choosing new sculptures that next, play, next fall will replace the five loaned pieces. So that's kind of a recap of, uh, of old business. The update for today is um, more accurately an invitation uh, to all of you, to all, to all of us. Um, to be more specific, it's an invitation to imagine. And this is the point where I hold up this flyer that, uh, that each of you, I think, should have. Um, imagine if the Celine community had its own arts and cultural center a place not only to see and experience visual, performing, and culinary arts, but also to learn about the arts, maybe even venture into creating, or depending on time and skill set, um, think about teaching. Celine's Arts and Cultural Center could be a place for our many musical groups to practice and perform. There might even be a recording studio. And this wouldn't be just for established musical ensembles, such as the Celine Fiddlers, Fiddlers Restrung, Celine Big Band, Celine New Horizons. We've got a lot of musical groups, but it could also be for garage bands. Who knows, the next Led Zeppelin or Little Big Town might be right here, right now in Celine, uh, waiting for a place to practice and perform. 
In our arts and cultural center, the theatrical groups and dance groups from town could rehearse and perform and have space to store their costumes, sets, and equipment, which is a problem for some of them now. Visual artists could learn and create, and then in the center's gallery, they could display their work. Culinary classes and group cooking could take place in a gourmet kitchen facility. These are just some ideas, but the possibilities are endless, and I think really, really exciting. The idea of a local arts and cultural center grew from the Arts Alliance in its study called the Washtenaw County Cultural Master Plan. The designers of the, county, of the countywide plan also worked with local community leaders and hundreds of individuals here in Saline. From this collaborative effort came the Saline Area Working Plan, um, which was published in 2010. If you don't, if you haven't seen it before, I passed out, or Linda passed out a copy, and it's interesting to take a look at. But a key recommendation that was put forth in the Celine Working Plan was the, establ uh, the establishment of an arts and cultural center. Keep two thoughts in mind. Number one, Houghton School is vacant, and the district is pursuing a tenant, the school district is, is pursuing a tenant or a buyer for the property. The second thing to keep in mind is the growing body of information and statistics that show a strong, how a strong cultural base creates a sense of place that in turn uh, attracts people, business, and dollars. Um, here's a handout that gives uh, a little bit of information and statistics along the lines that I've just been talking, and Linda is going to give you just a bit more information about that. This, this is publication uh, from ArtServe Michigan, um, and the one you have has very, very small print because it was printed off the website. This is what it looks like in real life, so if you want to read the back in less fine print, I have one copy. Um, this report came out uh, in January of this year. Um, I attended a session that included information about this report and, and other matters um, at the Michigan Municipal League um, conference in October. Um, and for us tonight, the takeaway from this page is one basic point is what we hope you will take away from it, which is we all recognize that the creative community enhances quality of life and our sense of place. But the data, this is, um, this is based on data that, that were collected from 2006 through 2010, and the data show that one dollar invested by the state in the creative community brought back $51 into the Michigan economy. Um, so our emphasis is not on the fact that that $1 came from the state. We're not looking at, at taxpayer funding here. But the point is that there is a real measurable, quantifiable economic advantage to supporting the arts and culture community as well. So in addition to quality of life, we're talking cold hard cash. Thanks. So based on there's a location that seems reasonable, at least at first glance, um, uh, and based on the information that Linda just spoke about, the, uh, the members of the Arts and Culture Committee think that the time is ripe to explore the possibilities of a Celine Arts and Cultural Center at Houghton School. In this light, we've scheduled two professionally facilitated forums to gauge interest, explore models, and envision possibilities. Uh, now, rest assured that, assured that um, other than the City of Saline Arts and Culture Committee's role as a catalyst to explore this idea of an arts and cultural center, the city has no involvement, uh, nor is future city funding expected or anticipated. Likewise, although the former Houghton School is being discussed as a location for the center, the involvement of the school district would be either as a landlord or a seller of the property. At this point, the idea of a Saline Arts and Cultural Center is in its infancy and has no endorsements or organizations aligned with it. However, as an entity that carries tremendous potential to benefit the city, I hope you'll plan to attend one of the forums. 
Uh, the first forum is scheduled for Thursday, January 24th, 7 p.m. at Stone Arch Arts and Events, downtown Saline. The second forum will be Tuesday, February 5th, 7 p.m., also at Stone Arch. We'll send out reminders. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, happy holidays, and in the spirit of the season, imagine. So February 5th one also at 7? Pardon me? Yes, February 5th one's at 7 also? <clears throat> yes, both of them at 7 o'clock. Yeah. Somebody had so, their memories down there, guys? Somebody have a question? No, well, I do have a, a quick comment. First of all, thank you, Nancy, for your very thorough presentation. Um, and then as it relates to the invitation to discuss the possible um, creation of a Selene Arts and Culture Center, I'm hoping that we can get um, the January 24th and the February 5th date on our website, maybe also include it in the Be Selene update. Okay. Maybe Facebook as well, the, the week of, of each of the, the forums. Just as a way of helping you. Any questions? Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Did you have a question, yeah. Mr. Gerard? Just want to say I appreciate your update because it, to keep this publicized and get it forward, we need to have these kind of like the updates all the time. So I thank you, Linda and uh, Oh, Nancy. well, you're welcome. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks for all your hard work. Okay, uh, next on the agenda, we have citizen comments on agenda items under the Open Meetings Act. Any citizen may come forward at this time, may comment or question on items that appear on this agenda. Comments will be limited to three minutes per person. And we would like to speak as requested but not required to state his or her name and address for the record. If not, uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda. The following consent agenda will normally be adopted without discussion. However, at the request of any citizen or council member, any item may be removed from the consent agenda for council discussion. And as you know, we have two changes to this agenda. so would be a motion to adopt the consent agenda as amended. So moved. Second. Mukirba, second. Morrow. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Item uh, 1209, emergency warning siren replacements. We motion to acknowledge receive the November, 20, uh, November 16, 2012 memo from Benjamin C. Pinet, emergency services planning coordinator to approve or not approve the new location for the installation of the emergency siren at Bemis Road between Old Creek Drive and Kevlin Drive, north side of the road between the Dairy Queen and the Selene Inn in lieu of the previous location in front of Chelsea Lumber. Move to approve. I second. Peter, second, Rod. Is there any discussion to approve? Questions? Mr. Ms. Tahar. Um, Thank you. I, I recall uh, when we discussed locations at the last meeting, there had been some concern expressed by, by a resident of, that, of the area, um, and he was pleased that the location of this siren had been moved um, to the location we're now not using. Um, so I, I believe that this will move the siren back closer to um, to his residence, though not as close as it was originally proposed. Um, I assume that his concern was about noise. Um, so I, I spoke with Mr. Campbell earlier today and, and um, understand that this siren will only be sounded once a month for testing. It's not the same, not on the same schedule as the every Saturday um, siren. So I, I'm going to assume that the, the noise problem, if that's what the concern was about, is, is probably not a huge issue. Mr. Morrow. Well, I appreciate Ms. Tahar bringing that up, and perhaps I can, I can clarify, because um, when this uh, issue was originally dealt with, I, I was in direct contact with the gentleman, and he was concerned not only about the noise, but also of the placement uh, of the siren in or around a residential area. So um, when it had been moved the first time, obviously he was very pleased that we were moving it out to, to US 12 in front of Chelsea Lumber. Um, you know, I, I tend to think that that was a better location, but for logistical reasons, it just is not going to work. But I, I do not suspect that he would have any grave concerns or objections with this, this current placement. Thanks. Any further discussion on the motion? Uh, all in favor to approve, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, under new business, item 12177, this is the employee health insurance for 2013. This would be a motion to acknowledge receive the November 27, 2012 memo from C. Andrew Campbell to 
approve or not approve the hard cap option for employee health insurance for 2013. Approve or not approve a change to the current health offerings to change from the current Simply Blue HSA high deductible, which is a $3,000 or $6,000 deductible with 100% coverage, to an alternate Simply Blue HSA high deductible, which is also $3,000 to $6,000, but with 80% coverage, and change from the current Community Blue PPO choice, Community Blue 2, to an alternate Simple Blue PPO at $500 or $1,000 deductible with 80% coverage, and keep the third offering of the Blue Care Network HMO. Do you have a motion to approve or not approve? Move to approve and approve. Second. Move road, second gear bond. Discussion? Mr. Campbell, you want to talk about a little bit since we had a board session on this? And sure, thank you, Madam Mayor. And um, uh, Tom Huntsinger is here from Capnick as well uh, to help out if, if need be. Um, but as, as uh, Mayor Drisco alluded, we did have a, a work session back on the 19th, so I'll try and do a summary of that um, uh, of that meeting. Um, but just to back up just to the beginning, uh, you all may recall the recent um, negotiations with uh, Teams for Level 214. Um, we were able to take, uh, a, a, be it a small step, but a step in the right direction of getting the exact uh, des uh, health plan design language out of the contract and into general language. Um, and one of the ways we did that was to invite them to participate in a committee, a health insurance or health benefits committee, to sit down and review the numbers, if you will, the, the, the uh, renewal numbers that, that came in in October. Um, again, so it was staff and Teamsters, representatives from, the, from both the, uh, we also invited um, and someone from the uh, Saline Police Officer Association as well as the Saline Sergeants Association even though their contract isn't up yet, but we, again, we're, we're all in this together. And, and uh, now more than uh, ever, especially with uh, the passage of Public Act 152, which uh, the governor signed into law um, last year, which is the uh, Publicly Funded Health Insurance Contribution Act, um, basically that, that puts a limit on how much uh, public employers can pay for uh, health insurance. Um, so, um, along with our partners, of course, of CAPNIC, our third-party uh, health uh, care uh, administrators, sat down, uh, received the renewal numbers from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, and uh, gives to, uh, also a note of interest, uh, all of our active employees are currently on the high-deductible uh, HSA plan. Um, it's a, a PPO plan. Um, um, so, um, so all actives are on that. We do offer two other... Um, Choices of a PPO and an HMO plan, and as you from the the motion that was just read, you can see we're proposing to uh, change the PPO, the secondary PPO offering. Uh, but again, these are this plan is to hopefully uh, help be more affordable. It's a lesser plan, if you will, benefit plan than the HSA high deductible, um, but it's, it still is a quality, certainly a very quality um, coverage, quality benefit. Um, so anyway, so the committee uh, convened. Uh, we had three or four at least meetings um, prior to the work session with city council, and we did everything from looking at the numbers to we also went out to two other carriers. Um, one is called Cops Trust, who traditionally covers uh, police and fire, but they do make some exceptions, and also Health Plus, uh, another provider, and uh, but unfortunately both of those to have similar plans uh, were, were a higher cost. So um, we looked at other options, the way we might modify um, blue, the current Blue Cross Blue Sh uh, Shield offerings that we have, um, which we did, but just a couple, just a quick, uh, out of the box, the numbers reflected before any changes. And this was, this was uh, medical, dental, vision, and life insurance. Um, for actives and retirees reflected a 11.23% uh, increase to the city uh, without any changes, which we, like I said, we, we have made proposing significant changes. Um, and of that, um, it was about 80, a little over $87,000. Majority of that would be on the burden of the employees because of Public Act 152. Um, and about, so it would be about $32,950 uh, would be the, uh, increase to the, the city cost and again of that 87,000 and change the rest would be um, 
borne by the by the employees. Um, so we, we looked at that, and so, so overall, we're looking with, with uh, the 32,950 reflects um, with premium and HSA contributions represents an increase of 3.2 percent. Um, so significantly lower than because with uh, 152 in place uh, to the city. Um, so we looked at the again the HSA high deductible plan, still the popular plan, but we looked at modifying it because the way it works right now um, is. It's a $3,000 deductible for a single person, $6,000 deductible for a two-person or family. Um, nothing is covered by the insurance until that deductible is met. Then once that deductible is met, everything but prescription drugs are, recover are covered 100%. Um, then the prescription drugs are covered after that by a, a three-tiered uh, uh, drug card, if you will. $10, $40, $80, um, up to an additional $2,000. So potential liability of $8,000 for a two-person family. Um, the, the city, again, has has and would continue under this proposal to contribute towards employees' um, uh, deductible, the, the, our, our HSA accounts, to help pay towards the deductible. Um, but we looked at that. and. We talked about another option, which the one we're proposing is instead of after those deductibles are met, that things, everything but, but prescriptions are covered 100%, it would be covered 80%. Um, and then again, up to the $2,000 additional limit. Um, but instead of just prescription drugs incurring that cost, it would be everything, co pays. Uh, or anything that, that uh, the 20% of any procedure or doctor's visit, all those things up to a ceiling of another $2,000. And if that is hit, then everything would be covered 100%. Um, so uh, that's what we're proposing um, is the main, because again, that's, that is the significant one because currently uh, all active, as I mentioned, all active employees are under that plan. Um, so that's what we're proposing. The um, and again, the, the uh, change from the current uh, community blue PPO choice um, to an alternative sim uh, simply blue um, PPO uh, with a 500 or or $1,000 deductible single two-person family deductible um, with, again, the 80% coverage similar to the HSA. Um, and again, the third offering, the HMO, which would remain the same. Um, then in reference to the... PA 152, um, again, as you may recall, um, the law that was enacted uh, last year, uh, cities have, have to make a choice either to go with a hard cap, which has a, um, maximums that the city can pay for a single, a two-person, and a family um, for the health, uh, health benefit. You can do a, the second option, alternative would be to choose the 80-20, where the city would only pay eight, could only pay up to 80% of the cost, and the employee would pick up the other 20, um, and then, or that you can opt out by two-thirds majority of the council vote could opt out. So, as as again, uh, staff recommendation hasn't changed. It's the same as last year to go with the hard cap. Uh, the hard cap is uh, um, does have um, the ability to. Uh, change year to year by whatever Department of Treasury determines is the medical uh, CPI, and they determined that was 3.5%. Um, so the um, went up 3.5%. So for 2013, the maximum for single coverage would be $5,693. Uh, Two-person coverage, $11,385. And the family coverage of $15,525. Um, so again, having said uh -huh. that, um, we would be um, the difference. We'd be the, the employees under the um, hard cap would be paying about 9.9 percent, um, and under the 80/20, again, we would be paying obviously the 20 percent. Um, and again, yes, there would be a larger savings with 80/20, but again, similar reasoning uh, as my recommendation last year is we don't know what fiscal year 14 holds. We know that. Um, we are seeing some glimmers of hope on our residential side, but we also know that um, commercial and industrial are still going to be taking a, a, at least a slight hit. Um, so as far as what is, we don't know what that means for 
what our, our wage wages might be proposed at for the next fiscal year. Um, you know, we have contracts coming up for both for all three bargaining units. Um, the one the Teamster contract that we just that was agreed to for this year is just a one year. So we'll have all three contracts. Um, so there's a lot up in the air, and we continue. And, you know, I, I won't be surprised if we continue to increase, you know, the amount of uh, financial burden on on us as employees for our, our benefits. Um, so again, that's I would, so that's why I want to be cognizant of that, and so that's why I would recommend, and the committee as well as as you see it's reflected in my memo, um, the committee uh, made that. Um, Recommendation, and as I told them, um, I I want to work with the committee, and I think it's I think we did a, it was some great work, and uh, a great effort, well received by most folks, and uh, but I also said you know I'm I'm the one that's ultimately held responsible by city council, so I do reserve the right to have that 51 percent, but I, I agree with the the recommendation, and um, so that's what we're putting forward. Thank you. So, does council members have any uh, questions about the presentation, Mr. Rhodes? Also, Tom's here, so. Okay, yeah, not, not a specific question because we did have the work session and, and we went through this in some detail. And mostly what I wanted to do was to thank city staff for their willingness to continue to work within the parameters that we have been given. Uh, nobody likes to have to give back something that's been given to them, not given, earned by them. And um, I, for one, and I'm sure the rest of council also, we really appreciate the fact that city staff is willing to work with us. Thank you very much. I think that would be a resounding yes. Absolutely. Any other questions from council about regarding the proposal? Yeah, trying times, but we appreciate everybody's contributions. So, um, if we don't have any further discussion on the motion, all in favor to approve and approve, say, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And under discussion items, we have uh, commission and committee reports. Do we have any? Mr. Gearbaum. Um, Historic District Commission discussed the issue with the concern of window replacement in one of the homes and seemed to have come to a somewhat resolution with the homeowner, but it may mean that they need to talk with the inv individual that installed the windows for them and how it's going to be resolved. We're also looking forward to trying to expand our website um, information and such that, so that we can help individuals that are in the Historic District Commission to understand where um, they can get additional information, perhaps other resources, and then pretend, potentially avoid some of these concerns that have come up in this last year. So that's one of our focuses are going to happen in December and in the new year. And hopefully that will have a one other thing that we're looking forward is trying to identify information on the web where the actual homes are. One of our uh, members of the commission is actually doing a um, project for her degree related to our historic homes, and so we'll hopefully have that electronic and available, and so we'll have information regarding every home that's out there so that people will be able to take a walking tour and actually be able to see on web or on their smartphone that information if we can get there. So that's our hope in the next year. Any other commissioner committee reports? Uh, any reports or any other announcements? Good holiday parade, good turnout, good weather. <laughs> Mr. Roth. The Selene Historical Society has their Christmas at Wrenchler Farm. It's going to be this weekend, Saturday the 8th from t noon till 5, and again on Sunday from 1 to 4. It's a nice event. You can go through and see the Rentschler farmhouse decorated in the 1930s. Far, far as cost, I think it's just a donation if you wish. Okay, Mr. Morrow. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to make a quick announcement because I'm in the process of um, finalizing the board and commission appointments for 2013, and so I wanted to, to ask my, uh, my council colleagues if you know of individuals um, in the city um, who would um, be able to contribute something tangible to one of our numerous boards or commissions. I would encourage you um, just to uh, uh, get them to fill out an application which can be found online and they can uh, denote their three top preferences and we'll uh, do our best to try and accommodate them. 
Um, if not, we'll keep their application on file and, and try and find them a volunteer opportunity when one uh, becomes available. Um, and for those of you in the audience and watching at home, um, again, you can um, find that application online. I would encourage you to, to fill it out. Um, serving on our boards and commissions is, is very important. It helps dictate policy in the direction of the city. Um, so if you have some time, um, not only do I think you'll be able to uh, contribute something tangible, I also think you'll enjoy serving. So please consider doing uh, what you can. Thank you. Are there any other reports and announcements? Okay, Mr. Campbell, you want to talk about our fun stuff in Lansing? Well, I'll do my best. Um, uh, city staff, um, who, uh, City Treasurer uh, Mickey Joe Bennett and uh, Chief Larry Rennick and I participated in, in what I would, I guess, call a quote unquote emergency uh, phone call with a uh, conference call with uh, MML and, and uh, numerous communities around. I think when we signed in, it was, you know, usually when you do a conference call, they'll say, you know, you're caller number three or two or five or something. We were caller number like 52 or something. So, um, but um, was it last Thursday or the Thursday before last, um, Lieutenant Governor Kelly announced um, the administration's uh, proposal to essentially eliminate the personal property tax um, with some sort of reimbursement um, with the, uh, don't bother me with the details. Well, we've got a couple in our head, but we're not sure exactly how it's going to work. Um, but, it, but the basis is a couple ways for communities to get reimbursed for the loss of personal property tax. One, it would allow cities to levy an essential services assessment on industrial folks. So we, and Mickey Joe and I were just talking about how we establish those form that, that formula because we're not exactly sure what that formula is yet. Um, but we basically, um, we wouldn't get reimbursed. Then the other is reimbursement through this um, uh, use tax. We'd get a percentage of the use tax to be reimbursed 80% um, approximately of what we, minus police and fire. And so this, this essential services assessment would be to, to assess on industry 100% um, of the percentage of the personal property tax that would otherwise go towards public safety. I know that sounds confusing, as confusing as I say it, but so it's up in the air. They're trying to push this through. They're trying to ram it through, for lack of a better term. They're trying to push it through um, lame duck session it, basically in three days. So they have their scheduled testimonies, taking testimonies. Tax policy committee um, is taking testimony tomorrow and uh, Wednesday, and they're trying to push it through. Um, with uh, without getting on too big of a soapbox, I will, but I mean, the re the question is why, and there's I think various versions of why they're trying to push it through, but nonetheless they are. And the other part, I think the other part too is the the one and a half percent of reimbursement of the use tax would be uh, taken care of by another layer of government that would be created, but that's um, only. That has to go to a vote of the people of the state of Michigan, so either in, in August or November. And if that fails, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe they said if that fails, then it would kind of be back to the drawing board, uh, I believe. But the essential services assessment, um, our understanding, because questions were asked during this conference call, was do, do your typical special assessment regulations and policies, do they go, are they, do you have to follow those? And the question was yes. So there, there are opportunities. I mean, that's not a no special assessment is a done deal. I mean, they have an opportunity to appeal, and so so there's so the the end of the day, the bottom line is, community could be out with that money. That's all. I mean, that's a significant for us. It's a significant amount. It's about um, well, you probably recall seeing in the audit letter about seven hundred and sixty-eight thousand um, dollars. We also again, one of the others. Uh, there's multiple. Um, uh, pieces of uh, bills that are that make up this this plan, if you will, um, and one that also that is near and dear to our heart is our being able to uh, capture uh, personal property tax in our LDFA to pay our debt service for our business industrial parks, and so that's apparently addressed. But again, things are 
and and I guess to, to the overall, you know, the the replace donor race coalition, you know, their their perspective along with MML is, um, we believe it's it's probably going to go away, so we don't think the battle should be to try and stop it from happening, but to work together to make it as palatable as possible to as many communities as possible. However, because they're trying to push this through in such a short time period, that um, in the three-day time, there's so many questions, so many questions on how this is going to impact um, communities. And, and I can tell you from the discussions that were on the, the telephone uh, this morning, there's a lot of concerns out there, which we all know, but, but we're here on the front line saying, wow, this is really going to hurt a lot of communities, including us. And how are they going to do this? And, and because it's, they are trying to push it through so quickly, and, and it is so, such a convoluted policy or plan, that um, it's going to be, you know, the, the, whether they're unintended or intended consequences, they're going to happen. And so our hope is that they, they hold off until these questions can be answered uh, in greater detail for all of us. Comments or questions, Mr. Morrow? I just want to elaborate on, on something Mr. Campbell said, and I appreciate his, his um, his report. Um, my understanding of the, the 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 latest news is that the legislature is going to be in session this week and then the following week. And uh, as Mr. Campbell alluded to, they have to move very quickly. It's starting in the House in the Tax Policy Committee, but then there's a rule in the legislature which states that once a bill is passed by either the House or Senate, there's a five-day holdover before it can be taken up and voted on by the other branch with the, the notion or idea being that legislators will actually review and ask questions um, prior to, to voting. Um, but I think that Mr. Campbell is absolutely right. The, the coalition is, is called Replace, Don't Erase, which I think is, is, is valuable and I think that should be our approach. However, in lame duck, because they're trying to essentially jam it through without a lot of discussion and without a lot of um, scrutiny, I think at this point it's best to just defeat the current legislation. So I would sort of um, encourage my colleagues to, to write to our state rep and our state senator and those of you in the audience and those of you who will be listening at home to, to do the same. Um, because if it, if it dies in the month of December, the whole issue has to be brought up and the legislation will have to be reintroduced in January. Mr. Gearbuff. Do we have any input from our current state rep as to how he's leaning towards this, Mr. Lament? Um, I, I don't. The, the simple answer is I do not. And so we should contact him? And yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you. When, when, you know, last year, I think it was, maybe it was last spring, he, he was on that panel and he said he would support full replacement. Um, I don't know if his position's changed, but you and I were at that chamber, Ann Arbor mm -hmm. Chamber thing, and they had a panel, and they were talking about some of the bills and everything, so I would hope that he would not support this because this isn't full replacement. Right. Um, so, but I think I would urge, I mean, I, I've been beating this drum for a long time, mm -hmm. and um, I see personally, this is a huge tax shift. At the end of the day, it's a tax shift from businesses to our residents. That's what will end up happening here because we cannot replace this revenue with anything but a tax increase. Um, there's no other vehicle, and this doesn't even, the use tax doesn't even, and not only that, but it also has an administrative fee, as Cam Mr. Campbell was saying, that will cause us to either take away that revenue or cause us to incur costs, and it's, not, it's still not clear how that's gonna be. But I think that's you know pretty crazy that they're not even, they're not reimbursing 100%, and they're talking about putting on a fee on top of that. But, you know, my concern at the end of the day is that it is, it's basically a tax shift. So, I mean, this community um, really supported building business parks that would provide, you know, taxable value, tax revenue, and this opportunity is being um, taken away. So, I, I'm, I'm up there talking about, uh, still trying to get the, um, you know, we'll collect it and they can rebate it off their, taxes up in Lansing once they get up to Lansing. I've gotten a little bit of, good. there's some room, I think. I've had a good conversation last night with some people, so, but I do agree that we definitely need to, you know, all hands on deck to try to uh, make sure our legislators understand that this is a very negative impact and that our citizens understand that this will cause a tax increase on them, ultimately, because there's no other way to absorb that 
less of 20% of our revenue. <clears throat> so while they are talking about refunding a portion of it, it's 80% in reimbursement of 40% of our expenditures because it's basically public safety dollars. And I believe, per our last audit report, our public safety is about 40%, you know, with the police. So if I remember correctly, I have our general fund, something in that area. So anyhow, anybody, I totally support what Mr. Morrow was saying, that anybody that um, is concerned about, you know, having to pay more taxes should call their legislator and ask them to make it 100% replacement. Like he suggested he would be interested in doing in the past. A guaranteed replacement. And Senator Richardville also, excuse me? A guaranteed replacement. Right. Yep, that was the other thing. Any other discussion? Just real quick. Um, although we have major concern with this, uh, with the tax policy and everything, there's a lot of other issues that are coming up in Lansing that seem to be taking some individual's priorities instead of looking at this. So there's a Senate Bill 975, which is looking at allowing basically discrimination for health professionals to be, um, and who they would basically treat based on a religious or moral convictions. And there's a couple other House bills, um, 5763 and 5764, which has to deal with adoption issues. And I'm just bringing those up because I feel strongly about it, that there's some stuff that is continuing to happen in our state legislature, which is just moving us backwards and not really bringing us forward. And I'm glad that the mayor will be moving into those positions in the future. Then there's one on concealed weapons, too. I don't know if you have been following that. <laughs> they want to expand the capacity for people to buy um, weapons without registering from private parties. So there was a, I actually am on that coalition. There's a coalition against illegal guns. Oh, yeah. It was actually started by Mayor Bloomberg, and I had a, another thing. I'm still doing more orientation, I think. I'm going to be oriented, hopefully really, really well oriented by the time January 1st comes. But So I wasn't able to go, but it, uh, it's very disconcerting that the sense that it makes sense to allow more and more people to access guns without registering in the state when it's, you know, the police, you know, everybody says it, it's not, it causes a less safe community at the end of the day by doing that. There's no way to track um, the police, you know, say, I mean, police chief, I'm sure you've been part, to part of this whole conversation that you, you don't, if the weapon's not registered, you can't track it. I mean, it makes life really difficult. Um, and it makes them more easily accessible. And I think we know that that is a problem in our um, communities, you know. So, um, yeah, there's quite a few interesting things going on. And then there's our, our, these education bills that are, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Mr. Campbell. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. Since we're talking about more legislation, I did want to also, one other one, uh, House Bill 5780, and I think we've talked about this in the past, or, but, um, you all may recall Public Act 54 that was passed last year, which is probably, um, it was mentioned today in the, in the call with MML, and I agree with it, that it's probably the most um, effective legislation that was passed on all these things that, that came through the governor's administration last year. But it was basically to say no, when it comes to collective bargaining, no retroactivity. So typically, historically, the drill has been when you start negotiations, if you go beyond the uh, the date of the current contract, well, that's okay because people eventually get their back pay, right? They, once you c figure out, once you come to an agreement um, uh, and both sides agree, then they, you just go back to July 1st and they get their pay their, that they with the increase, if per, for instance. Um, well, they've passed this, and it's encouraged folks to move negotiations along and not keep them lingering and. To, so there is no um, um, no retroactivity uh, with with any of the benef uh, payer benefits. And matter of fact, if the increase were to, for instance, the if the increase of the benefits were to go up, they would have to begin paying those uh, based on the the Public Act 152 um, law. So now um, now this House Bill 5780 says, hold it, we want to make an exemption for public safety for police and fire. Um, and and one of the th comments that I've heard from Lansing is, oh, well, we, this was just meant to be f for the original uh, 50 public, act, or public, public Act 54 was for, for um, schools, for school employees. Um, well, what about um, the other city employees that are in collective bargaining units? And so I don't buy that argument. I mean, I think this, this has been a very positive legislation for cities 
for municipalities to, when it comes to collective bargaining. And I think it's proper, so I would also encourage you to contact our legislators and let them know that it's not a good thing because it did, it did come out of committee last Thursday, out of the local government committee, I believe is the proper name. And um, we've also been told that if it gets through the House, it's already, they're already going to, they've already said in the Senate they'll pass it, and Governor Snyder's already said he'll sign it. So, um, so the only, our only hope to stop this is, is in the House. And again, they're trying to push it through during lame duck. So I would encourage you all, if you share my opinion, to, uh, to call, and, which I already have. But so, thank you. Any other um, discussion? Uh, on your public comment under the Open Meetings Act, any citizen may come forward at this time and comment or question the city council. This public comment hearing will be limited to three minutes per person. And one who would like to speak as request but not requir required to state his or her name and address for the record. Mary has 600 Canterbury. My one question is uh, the uh, tax abatements. Uh, we've given quite a few tax abatements and uh, how that would work and um, it would not there was no, affect There wouldn't them? be anything to abate because they wouldn't be paying that. Okay, so they, that would be, and they are aware of the abatements that's been given. They're aware that this law would, thank you. Any other citizen comment? <coughs> if not, um, is there any other business to come before the Lincoln City Council? We have a, a work session on December 11th, 7 p.m., as discussed on Saturday. We do not have a work meeting on the 17th. We will be having a reception for our attorney and myself at 6.30 on the 17th and our regular meeting at 7.30. And then the next regular meeting is on January 7th. We'll be installing the new mayor and the new council. We have a motion to adjourn at 8.30. So moved. Second. Tomorrow, second gear bar. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries.